It's my pleasure to get us started. Clearly, there's a lot of people who've put a, a lot of energy into today's talk, so I'm just the spokesperson to get us moving. Uh, today, we're talking about co-teaching computer science across borders. How can we make learning at scale human-centric? And just for a little bit of background of who I am, uh, if you don't know, my name is Chris Peach. I'm assistant professor at Stanford, but an important thing to know about me is I didn't grow up at Stanford. I actually grew up in Kenya and Malaysia, uh, and now I love teaching. I absolutely love teaching, but I can't help but recall my childhood and, and think about the computer science I teach now, how can I make it more accessible to the sorts of folks that I grew up with? A lot of us are here because we care about learning at scale, right? And to a lot of us, that means learning digitally, learning online, and often learning on platforms. Uh, and I think learning at scale started about the year after the first MOOCs, where people learned online for the, uh, at a massive scale. Uh, and it was a really exciting time, but you know, I think we can all agree that it left something to be desired. For those of you who have taken a MOOC, it doesn't always feel that social. It doesn't always feel that participatory in who's creating the MOOC. Uh, and you, perhaps because of this, not everyone is succeeding to the level that we'd want. And this just leaves us with the feeling that there has to be a better way. Uh, and this idea that I'd like to talk to you guys about today and introduce you to is expressed through a program that we call CS Bridge. And it's just our response to what we experienced in MOOCs that was really amazing and at scale, but just didn't feel as human. So we asked ourselves the question, how could we expand and potentially iteratively refine a very human learning experience around the world? What would it look like if you tried to get the sort of scale you had at MOOCs, but mix it with the really good, wonderful human experiences that we all live and love when we're teaching and learning? Now, on some level, this idea of how you could scale human learning has been really the secret sauce uh, over at Stanford in the computer science department. So when we teach CS1 in our university, you know, we don't use a MOOC to teach our own students. Instead, we have the system for scaling up human learning. So you know, when I teach CS1 and we have 500 students, I don't just lecture to 500 students and their experience in the class isn't just 500 people coming and trying to learn from me. Instead, what we do is we break the students up to small groups and crucially, we hire talented students who've gone through the class to come back and participate as teachers. We call them undergraduate uh, TAs or section leaders. Uh, and it just means that every single person, even though they're in a 500 person class, they have a small human experience. This is the secret sauce to Stanford. And I think it really drives this amazing theme for learning at scale that I'd like to share with all of you. It's really a thesis that I believe in deeply. We could scale learning by making great online tools, but there's other ways to scale learning. Uh, one key insight is, you know, there's a lot of people who wanna learn, but there's also a lot of people who want to teach. And from my experience, at least in computer science, the amount of people who wanna teach is almost the same as the amount of people who wanna learn. Most people who go through a learning experience enjoy the process of turning around and becoming teachers. This thesis requires us to kind of reimagine who gets to be a teacher. Often it's somebody who's just learned pretty recently. But there's a lot of magic that comes from this idea. One is you get human scale. But the other one is there's just so much joy in teaching. And there's one of the most fun things in the world is to learn something new. But if I could think of something a little bit more fun than learning something new, it's to teach something new. Uh, and beyond the joy that you get from sharing knowledge with a fellow human being, there's just also this education that you receive yourself. So uh, I think that there's this opportunity to expand who gets to be a teacher, but there's two barriers and CS Bridge is going to be addressing those. One, can we lower the barrier to access teaching materials? You know, can we make more teachers by giving them more materials? And two, can we effectively spread teaching know-how? In CS Bridge, what we're gonna give you today is one, a course in a box so that any person who wants to be a teacher can become a teacher. Uh, and if you want to become somebody who inspires other uh, novice teachers, you can. Uh, and then secondly, there's a model for how we can share know-how by co-teaching. Uh, throughout this talk, one of the things that we're gonna give you is a whole bunch of material and also an invitation to join us in teaching. We love teaching, we love teaching with other people. Okay, so where are we going to go? I'm gonna tell you about this cool project. Um, first, we're going to talk about this course in a box, then about co-teaching. We'll talk about some of the impact we've had, and then an interesting case study. 
So what we've designed, the main contribution that we have for you today is we just have a course that you can unroll and you can go teach that, so that if you want to become a teacher, you just have the material ready to go. The prerequisites for this course are simply that a student knows how to turn on a computer. And realistically, if they can just recognize a computer that's on, that should be enough. Uh, and in the course, we take people from you should be able to recognize a computer that's on until you should be able to program a graphical game like Breakout. And, and that is the final objective. Though the true learning goal for this course is inspiration. We made this course in a box so that teachers can pick it up and go teach an in-person class. It comes with a website, PowerPoints, you know, lesson plans for section leaders, a way to translation, and of course, a whole bunch of assignments that have been tried all over the world and have been internationalized so that they're relevant uh, in a whole bunch of contexts. So we made this thing, you can go use it, it's a good time, and it is, one of the things it comes with is this idea of section leading. So you can go use it, you can teach it on your own, or you can get a whole bunch of section leaders and you can teach it as a larger scaled in-person teaching experience. It's a course that's made in, for Java. We also have a version that's made in Python. It fits into two weeks if you go full time, but you can expand it as you like. So, so far I've told you about how I would love to scale human learning. And now I've told you that we have this course that allows you to scale human learning, but it's not really enough to have material. Uh, one of the things that we've been experimenting with in CS Bridge is not just material, but how could you spread a good idea amongst teachers? It turns out teachers have a bit of, you know, it's hard to get everyone to adopt uh, new ideas. And so uh, one way that we figured out how to do this is through cross-border co-teaching. Not only do we have material and we would like people to be able to use it, but one of the ways that we've figured out how to spread the material is to go join with other teachers in different parts of the world and teach the class together. And it's the most fun thing ever. If you've taught, it's a good time. If you teach with somebody else, uh, it's even better. And one of the reasons that it's so useful to teach with somebody else is that you know, not only do you get the joy of partaking in the teaching experience with somebody else, but you can learn how to teach from going to a conference like Learning Scale. You can learn how to teach by going to something like uh, in professional development. But the most learning I've ever done about how to become a great teacher has been to join and teach with other folks. Uh, one of our co-instructors, Barish, who is in a time zone, it's hard for him to talk, uh, wanted to say something really quickly about co-teaching. Co-teaching with the instructors uh, from different cultures is a transforming experience. Um, because one sees uh, different ways of uh, teaching, getting prepared for teaching and improving their styles, the, the communication. Uh, thing, these are things that one cannot learn from a book. Uh, and you can only learn it uh, by experiencing it and observing it. And okay, so, you know, so far we've said that there's a, uh, several ways that we can uh, learn and spread learning at scale. Uh, we have this course in a box for you and also we believe in this cross-border co-teaching as a great way to spread know-how. Uh, and on that note, I was going to pass it over to Anna. Anna, are you there? Yes, I am here. Uh, and so, yeah, we do have that model in terms of cross-border co-teaching and we just wanted to point it out that that co-teaching happened also in different fields such as medicine and other related uh, experiences. And so when we talked about cross-burden teaching, there are the three elements we need to consider. So the first one is the cultural element. Uh, the next one is the pedagogical element. And the third one is the organizational. And so for cultural, there is an important piece, which is language. So there are places in which there are like different spoken language. And so for example, in the case of Colombia, we did have this process in Spanish. And we know that language plays a key role in learning. And that happens also when they are learning TS. It's very important that students are taught in their mother tongue. In terms of pedagogical, we do know that effective TS teaching practices are very important to share and exchange. And one of those has been that we have been identified is clear communication. When teachers students and like local students are able to share in this co-teaching model, they also are able to compare, discuss, and inspire 
others. And finally, organizational, it is very important to build that institutional knowledge and technical infrastructure. So for example, like the way the class is designed, the number of students or the process in which students interact with professors, which is very important to also build it in these local communities and also exchange knowledge and experience. And in our course composition, there is something that is very important and it's how the teacher and the students and the same students become teachers and they support. So we do have students who are very close in age to the students who are participating in the programs. And this creates also like a community of learnings, not only between the teachers, but also like the student teachers who are from different contexts. And now I'm going to pass it up to Lisa. Hi. So at this point in the talk, we've gotten you excited about the 10,000 mile high view of how we taught. And now we're gonna talk about the 9,000 mile high view of what we did. So since 2014, we've actually taught in four different countries for a total of 10 different course offerings. And now off, most often our campuses of learning have been large universities in order to attract a diversity of students across the country. But we'll talk about that special case of uh, Cumbia, Guinea and West Africa later in this talk. And you can see that it's really been a very human experience. And we just wanted to show you what this looks like over the next few slides. Our classes were taught in various languages, often a mix of English and the host country's language, but some like the one in Bogota, Colombia, uh, were also Spanish only to really cater to the student population. Yeah, good times. <laughs> Next slide. By 2019, so last year, uh, we were able to teach our 1,000th high school student worldwide, which is really awesome. But what's even more wonderful is that we were also able to grow our undergraduate TA population as well. And what we saw is in terms of what the students learned within just two weeks, often just nine days of programming, students were able to implement these graphics based games and calendar scheduling apps all in Java. And we even found that on the classic Atari brick break game breakout, on average, our high school students completed this coding project faster than their university peers, even after we learned what we, we brought what we learned from CS bridge back to our university CS one. Next slide. We found that by and large, compared to before the program, students felt a very strong identity immediately after the CS Bridge program. Uh, and we can click the animation here. So right after the CS Bridge app program that they participated in across different countries and gender identities, they improved by often one point on the Likert scale. Now, something important to see here uh, in the next slide is that the biggest impact of our course is probably the impact felt to teachers and particularly those on the undergraduate TAs who found teaching really fun, like what Chris said earlier. And we found that our CS Bridge experience actually strengthened teaching confidence for many of these uh, university level teaching assistants and even encouraged some of them to, uh, to continue teaching full time. Now, these were just some whirlwind results given the exciting times we live in and also the short conference talk times. So please do read our paper, paper for more details. Thanks, Lisa. So at this point, we've talked about the course, the power of co-teaching and how we apply these lessons in the university context in various countries. And now we're gonna talk about a trial of this program outside the university context in an especially low resource, high need community in Guinea, West Africa. So I taught physics with the Peace Corps for two years in Cumbia, a, a farming village about 12 hours from the capital where most families live on less than a dollar a day. Students rarely touch computers, but smartphones are ubiquitous. And during my time there, students built a tech room and started learning computer skills. So we originally said, okay, students only have to turn on a computer, but is that really true? We really couldn't assume people knew how to type, people knew, had a lot of familiarity. So we couldn't assume regular uh, electricity, familiarity with computers, familiarity with references that were in the curriculum, consistent attendance due to familial expectations, and we couldn't assume that people could keep up with the pace. So we made some adaptations. We ported the curriculum offline. We did more electricity-free coding. We taught at a flexible pace. We did it in three weeks rather than two weeks, and we worked with local teachers and students to update the assignments so that students really um, understood the references and that it, it, it was interesting to them. So things that stayed the same were this co-teaching model, the curriculum structure, and the joy in learning and in teaching that we all felt. Um, I'm just speeding through this, but you can read about this in the paper. So by joining with local instructors, we've seen spin-offs so that CS learning programs in Guinea are growing and iteratively improving. So this is Musa, one of my collaborators in Guinea, and uh, a local 
uh, TV station covered the work that he was doing, teaching this program after we had taught it for the first time. And we also started a collaboration with Peace Corps in Guinea and um, hopefully in other countries, which was cut short because of COVID. But we plan once Peace Corps volunteers are reinstated after their ev evacuations that um, we'll keep collaborating with Peace Corps to expand to CS for All. And we have many other spin-offs we talk about in the paper. Some are um, on this slide. And we really encourage you to use and extend our work in the same way. So please reach out if you're interested. Chris? Yeah, you know, I just also want to mention really quickly, we spent the last 15 minutes talking about teaching in person. Does that remind us of all the good times that we had before COVID-19? Uh, and just, you might have wondered, what happens to an in-person class now that we can't be in person? Uh, and it turns out the answer is we can still be human and online. We took this exact same model this year, and we, instead of doing teaching 1,000 students, we taught 10,000 students and we recruited 1,000 section leaders from all over the world. Uh, and we're going to be excited to tell you about how this idea of human learning could also be scaled uh, digitally. It was a ton of fun. I had such a good time teaching with and learning from all these other wonderful instructors. Uh, and this paper is really a celebration of our chance to learn from one and each other. Thank you guys so much and for all the great questions. We'll look forward to answering them in the chat.